Wir kommen zurück. Jetzt werfen wir einen Blick über den Tellerrand, über den hinaus und fragen, wie es sich. We are going to ask the question: What about civic commitment in Belarus this summer, this fall? The next panel has been organized in cooperation with our partners of Friedrich Ebert Foundation and Arthur Schreibmann. You have the floor. Hello, thank you so much. We are continuing with our Minsk Forum, and right now we're talking about the local activities, the local civil society, given what is happening in the country, because this cannot be ignored. And the Belarusian will revolution, as somebody calls it, or uprising, as somebody calls it, or political crisis, whatever has an unprecedented scale in the region. It uh, has been unseen uh, in case of many of the protest movements, uh, even those that were successful. Tens of cities, you know, it was more than 30, even officially, um, during the first days and um, later on, uh, they are just innumerable. If we try to count all of the larger and lesser protests. So, without any further ado, I would like to briefly introduce our honorable speakers, the panelists, Tatiana Karatkevich, the co-chair of the Public Association, Tell the Truth, and the former presidential candidate five years ago, Mr. Terry Suk, the director for the International Fund of uh, Rural Territory Development. As far as I can understand, he is representing the Mogilov Oblast, Olga Karic, the head of the uh, human rights organization Our Home. She's from Vitebsk. Alexander Yaroshuk, the president of the Belarusian Trade Union Association. And a uh, leader, um, long standing leader of the Belarusian Trade Union Development. Sir Clara gave it the deputy of the federal chair of. Uh, Social Democratic Party of Germany. So uh, she's a local council representative, and it will be interesting to take a look at uh, what is um, uh, happening uh, uh, with our awakening regions from their perspective. So we're working in our traditional mode, uh, five minutes per speaker for the introductory remarks, so that we have um, some more time for questions. Our session is rather short. After five minutes of introductory remarks, I will give you a couple of questions, and after that we're going to follow up with uh, the questions in the chat from our viewers. So I would like to ask the Belarusian speakers to focus on your areas of competences. I won't be asking many detailed questions for now. Now you were suggested uh, a huge range of opportunities beforehand in that uh, sphere of topics. So Tatiana, let's start with you. Tatiana, we cannot hear you. Uh -huh. So, uh, hello everybody, and I'd like to greet the participants of the Minsk Forum. It is the 23rd event in a row, and I'm happy to be participating in it on an ongoing basis, and I would like to thank the organizers for sustaining the tradition for keeping it up. And I would like to thank particularly the organizer of this forum, Rainer Lindner, who has been our guardian angel and uh, who is helping us all the way. And I'm happy that uh, this is um, going on. And this is, you know, for us, this is the international solidarity and international support. What I would like to say is that even though Artem has uh, mentioned all the possible names of what's happening, this is a political crisis and uh, whatever you may call it, this is a unique moment in time where the old authority is rotting and crumbling down. And it is doing it basically by itself, doing it to itself because of not keeping the promises it is giving to the people. It has developed an unprecedented level of mistrust on the part of the citizens to the decisions that are 
being taken. And, you know, right now it looks like the old authorities are the opposition, actually, and they're using the administrative and law enforcement uh, uh, measures that they have at their disposal, and they're basically forcing us to civil conflict instead of uh, resolving the situation peacefully. And right now the situation in the regions and among the citizens is the following. They came to participate in the life of the state and the political light, life because they saw an opportunity to stand up for their interests, legally vote for the alternative outcome, observe the elections, uh, apply to be the members of electoral commissions. So achieve the truth that they have been longing for for so long, change the authority. We see that the civil society in Belarus has come to fruition and is now showing its peaceful nature and the intent to participate in legal initiatives. I want to underline that because this is both a huge plus and a huge minus because what we get is the problems that we currently have in the regions and in Minsk, that uh, there is the disproportional level of repression towards the citizens who show their civil position by whatever means they have. In the regions, this is especially hefty because the amount of repressions per capita is disproportional to the number of people who are ready to voice their civic position. So now we have uh, a clear picture of uh, how the authorities react. They close their doors on us and uh, they don't want to have any dialogue and they fight the peaceful demonstration in the cities. As Artem said, this was over 30 cities. I think now it is even more. And besides that, there's a huge number of petitions petitioning the local authorities with uh, uh, requirements and requests of lawfulness, of recalculating the um, rigged elections. So this shows us that the society is willing to engage and to show their positions uh, by any means possible. But we see the closed doors policy and the doors keep closing because not all of them have been closed so far. There was the uh, vertical of authority, the, 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 the vertical of power, but right now we also have it at the local levels. So I would like to thank all of the people, especially in the regions, who participate, because in the regions we see that people are very much motivated by the fact that there are many of them. They recognize each other. And, you know, they say, wow, we have suddenly learned that there are a lot of people who are like-minded, who, and, you know, the people who were a not reluctant to participate in the political process before that, right now feel the urge to do so. You know, so such towns as Dragic and Lida and so on, people have seen each other, they have got acquainted with each other and they still keep together and they uh, help each other. And of course, another certain source of support is the media, the independent media, the bloggers, the telegram channels that uh, give us the truth that we crave for. People crave truth these days. And uh, media support is paramount these days. Solidarity matters. Um, we have uh, a lot of creative ideas coming up and being implemented very quickly. And local activities are still abundant. Uh, neighborhood meetings, fora, concerts, joint petitioning, training events. Right now, there is an immense potential for these new people who are the main uh, asset of the revolution that's happening in the civil society. We need these people to find a way to implement their potential to self-actualize. And these people already have the experience of uh, uh, civic engagement and social activities, and they have the truth, most importantly. Day after day, I think it is very important to preserve the unity that we have. 
and bring the actual change forward. But for that, we need to take a lot more steps that we have to take, most importantly, together. Tatiana, thank you very much for very good time management, among other things. So, Sergei Tarasuk, now your foundation is not uh, immediately politicized, so I won't be asking you to provide uh, uh, political analysis, but I'm just wondering how the situation that's happening in the country um, has affected what you can observe at the grassroots level, the civil engagement of the people, their wish to participate in self-governance and the involvement of the people in solving various questions. Um, you can give the examples from your particular region. Sergey, we can't hear you so far. The sound is on, but we can't hear you. So maybe there's a problem with the earphones. If you could uh, uh, disconnect the earphones and uh, switch to using just computer audio instead of a headset, that might be better. No, Sergey, unfortunately, we cannot hear you uh, try to reconnect uh, the device and uh, the headset. Try to turn them off and uh, just, you know, communicate via PC instead of using the headset. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, I do apologize. So, Artem, thank you very much for the invitation. And I thank the organizers, of course. And at the very beginning, I would like to say that our organization works not only with uh, the Mogadov region, as you have said, it works all over the country. And the main goal that we have that we pursue in our activities is improving the level of business activity and act in general level of activeness of the local development. And uh, we have the project on developing and implementing local initiatives and community level initiatives. So if we take a look at the period of time that our organization has been operating in those areas, the level of civic engagement and initiative in the local communities has increased. There are different fora uh, and uh, different events during which the people, together with the local authorities, present a lot of initiatives. Not so long ago, November 23rd to 27th, that we had the second regional forum, which was dedicated to such issue as regional um, interaction, regional cooperation for sustainable development of local economies. And we have uh, platforms, uh, 14 platforms uh, dedicated to different topics, uh, sustainable development, uh, education and training, what uh, do we do about uh, the schools at universities and universities, um, uh, digitalization uh, and uh, NGO activities, so all of that was discussed. One of the questions that was asked to me is what is the situation, the status quo with um, non-governmental organizations right now? I would say that um, business activity requires special services and conditions to develop. And this is something that NGOs can provide now. The non-commercial organizations have uh, increased their share, different, different forms of that, uh, consumer societies, um, uh, public associations, and so on. Non-profit organizations are considered from different perspectives. First and foremost, in terms of the services that can be rendered by them, including the services related to fundraising and support of target populations. The main source of funding is the European Union, certainly and grant assistance rendered by the EU as well as United Nations Development Programme funds 
as well as assistance rendered by other institutions acting in the territory of Belarus. We cooperate with all our partners. As for the level of engagement in civic authorities, this is impossible without cooperation and interaction with local authorities. The level of rural communities and rural councils at the level of regions, we have mutual support and understanding, as well as readiness to discuss any ideas and any projects. In general, just like in any other situation, including the one that we are witnessing today, the most important thing is as follows. In order to ensure development of business activities, we need active dialogue with understanding and aspiration to move forward. Probably this is all I wanted to point out, and should there be any questions, I'm ready to take them. Thank you so much. Yes, I believe there will be some questions, naturally. Now I'd like to yield the floor to Olga. Olga, are you with us? We cannot see you. Olga, да. Olga. You are welcome to switch on your microphone. Please outline the potential of our today's crisis situation. It is crisis in all respects, in terms of the economy, in terms of the humanitarian affairs, and so on and so forth. So what is the potential of local initiatives and the local civil communities? Well, thank you so much for yielding the floor to me. I wanted to outline the potential as well as the new trends that we are witnessing. These are unprecedented and we haven't seen those even six months ago. I believe the situation related to COVID-19 in Belarus and everything that happened with regard to it was a actually sort of starting point. However, there were some more profound reasons behind the trends. There is a strong requirement for modernization of the cultural, economic and social areas. At the same time, all those processes were triggered by COVID-19. And I believe this is due to the fact that Belarusians always had some patriarchal expectations towards the state that used to act as a mediator or as a uh, source of power. But in case of COVID-19 response, uh, the state has not provided any assistance and started to pronounce some derogatory remarks with regard to the uh, people's situation. They were saying that the nature will help us and that COVID-19 is not so bad as it is shown. And I believe this somehow changed our vision of the world, actually. What are we witnessing today in the regions? We're witnessing something that was not there even six months ago. We are seeing the start of processes related to historic memory, historical memory of Belarusians. And this is expressed in huge interest towards whatever was happening before the Second World War. The topic of Stalin's repressions and concentration camps of the Soviet Union has always been a taboo. And uh, these topics were always uh, actually silenced by the state and the relatives of people who face repressions always face some uh, taboos and repercussions. So currently uh, there is a huge interest in history, including the World War II events, as well as those following it. Besides, we are seeing a lot of uptick in local patriotism in the local communities. For example, every city has some streets named after some heroes. And, for example, uh, we also have local chats that are increasingly popular among the population. People are using those to somehow understand what is happening with them and who they really are. 
Self-awareness level is increasing. Besides, uh, there are lots of initiatives and suggestions. Prior to that, we used to compare ourselves with other nations. And for example, Ukrainians were really easy to mobilize to implement any idea. And it was really easy to mobilize local and community organizations in Ukraine. Meanwhile, in Belarus, it was really hard to mobilize the public. And it took some six months, for example, to promote some issue, to raise the awareness of the population. Now the situation is different. And now we have a lot of people addressing us with their own initiatives. And we are becoming too slow for them. So the processes that we're witnessing are speeding up, which is extremely important. I would like to say that it is extremely encouraging that Belarusians are very punctual and are very uh, laborious, so to say, and diligent. And people are really demanding and scrupulous. They pay a huge deal of attention to different checklists, different uh, forms, and so on and so forth. Previously, it was next to impossible to uh, force people into using checklists, for example, but now uh, people are very eager to join us. The third feature, which is really unique for the regions, it is not as pronounced in Minsk. This is about the synergy and linkages of small scale local initiatives with the diaspora in foreign countries. And people who left Belarus due to non-political reasons have woken up actually and now are bridging these gaps. And we are witnessing some peer-to-peer -peer engagement, which is receiving a lot of development now. And this is a great value, in my opinion. People are seeing the value of communication and mutual support. I am close to you. Uh, wrapping up. I would like to voice certain difficulties and challenges that are witnessed by the regions. First and foremost, we need some programs for stimulation of grassroots initiatives, as well as bloggers' movements. Today, YouTube bloggers, in the majority of cases in Belarus, are jailed. But at the same time, there is a huge demand for them, especially in small cities and towns. There is a huge demand for authentic and dependable information. And bloggers require minimum resources, but have a huge uh, coverage. And the population is really in need for such local grassroots initiatives. We need to ensure the visibility of such initiatives in small communities. We are witnessing really disproportionate repressions, but at the same time, we have a lot of initiatives and there is a need to visualize those initiatives because currently we're lagging behind with this. Thank you very much. I'm finished. Thank you one more time for the invitation. Thanks for being that informative. I believe we will continue our discussions during the Q&A session. I would actually keep listening and listening to you, but we need to fit into the time frame. I would like to yield the floor to the next speaker, being Alexander Yoroshuk. Alexander, I believe this is the renaissance year for the trade unions movement. So I'd like to receive some first-hand input from you with regard to your vision. Are you seeing some uptick in activities? And what is the way forward for the trade unions movement, given the unprecedented turbulence, including in the organized labor groups? Well, the word renaissance couldn't be more correct to use in this case because it reflects all the trends related to the trade unions movement. Frankly speaking, I have been the head of the Belarusian Congress of Democratic Trade Unions for 18 years, and I actually felt like I wouldn't live till the day when uh, these trade unions would be in demand. But finally, we have a great demand for these structures, which is actually 
quite miraculous, but if we analyze it profoundly, we will see that there is no miracle behind it. There is a certain demand from the general public. And what is more, public or state-owned trade unions are no longer in demand. The population needs real trade unions that are independent. And this demand is especially pronounced, especially starting from August. We are joined by new stakeholders. I cannot say that this influx is extremely significant, but there are some certain clearly cut trends that will allow to consolidate the trade unions movement and make it strong. Definitely, we realize that we have received some 20% increase in the uh, number of stakeholders, but this does not mean that the processes are irreversible. There are some reasons behind that, both objective and subjective. And the union, the public uh, association of trade unions, the state-owned one, is able to control the situation, although they are losing people. And they have lost some 20% of members. These uh, people uh, that are leaving now initially were forced into this association and were forcibly cut there as members. Certainly not all, all of them join us immediately and we are completely okay with that. We understand that there are some reasons behind that. Today, the establishment of trade unions still requires authorization from the state authorities. We try to apply for establishment of a new organization. This is a organization of IT specialists. And certainly the application was rejected by the authorities at the end of the day. There are some other reasons behind that, and I'm not going to delve deep into those now. And what is really encouraging is the fact that our organization is joined by enterprises and besides, we have seen that some of the uh, long-standing members of our association have uh, found themselves in the epicenter of the recent events. These are uh, the ones in Grodno and Mogilev and so on and so forth. In Grodno, there are no independent trade unions and having spent many years under such challenging conditions, Grodno people have learned how to protect their own interests, especially with regard to political strikes that are directly related to the change of the regime. And these people want uh, the country to shift from dictatorship to a viable democracy. Definitely, at the same time, we have sustained heavy losses. And we have seen 65 members of the strike committee put behind the bars. We have lost many people, and this is exceptionally sensitive for us in terms of our funding. We have lost many enterprises in the capital, and we were ousted from many sectors by the state authorities. The state authorities were deliberately destroying independent trade unions, but we still managed to find our way back to different state-owned enterprises. At the same time, you do remember the recent events when Svetlana Tikhanovska urged the population to start the all-national strike. And we responded to that call. In the vast majority of cases, we lost the most active uh, representatives of our association at the enterprises that responded to that call. But I believe it is erroneous to say whether or not it was correct 
to come up with a call for all national strike coming from Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. Today there is no response to that question. Anyway, we need to be ready to pay a certain price for our freedom and from our democracy. We need to sacrifice something. As for the future, Alexander, please, you have one minute remaining. Yes, certainly. I would like to say the following. We do not expect that in the nearest future we will have a massive influx of new people. But the true renaissance of independent trade unions will only start after some real changes in the country. And undoubtedly, the members of independent trade unions will be playing a decisive role in this process. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we are yielding the floor to our German colleagues. I have a lot of questions to Clara Gavitz. But given the rigid time frame, I will focus on a couple of those questions. What is the Germany's vision of the uptick in uh, civil activities being observed in Belarus for the time being? Being premised on your country's experience and your own experience, what is the role of political engagement of the population? And uh, what role is allotted to the local authorities? Please. Yes, hello to everybody. The current situation in Belarus showed Europeans for the first time that it's necessary to pay attention to this country. And there has been huge solidarity with those that took to the streets. And this new attention is a huge opportunity for the transformation process, which is not going to be easy. I myself was born in the GDR, and in summer 1989, we asked ourselves what the future direction of the GDR is going to be, whether we are going to embark upon a Polish path, similar to the Solidarność development with free elections, or whether we are going to embark upon the Chinese path with the protests and the massacres. And I remember there were very many emotions at the time in the country. And based on what I have heard, really strongly reminds me of the situation in our country in 1989. So... I wish you a lot of energy, a lot of power and support. Support and energy to everybody who is supporting the democratic process. What we have learned is the following. The Friedrich, oh, Friedrich Ebert decades ago said, democracy requires Democrats. What did he want to say with this? Friedrich Ebert wanted to say that you should not leave politics to policy makers. Democracy is based on many people becoming active, making their contributions. I mean, they don't all have to run for president, but everybody has to make their own contribution. In other words, we need democratic co-determination in companies. We need schools where parents also have a say when it comes to the educational concept where everybody can figure out how they can change their village and their town. And taking all this together creates a civil society where people live a free life, where nobody tells them how to live, but where they can design their own everyday life. And this makes a person a Democrat. And what I find very important is what we can see currently in Belarus. This is not a movement that is just happening in Minsk. In many countries of this world, there is a certain despise to capitals. People say, oh, they lead a totally different life. They have a different lifestyle. People are more political in, cap in capitals. And they feel emotionally distanced to capitals, people who live in rural areas. But this is not the case in Belarus, which is very good. And what 
I could share with you from the German perspective is the following recommendation. In the GDR in 1989, we had broad masses taking to the streets and they eventually toppled the system. But very quickly, did it result in passiveness with people after the first transformation-related issues had become visible? Many people then withdrew to their own homes and cared about their own economic issues. And the biggest challenge is for you to sustain this energy, to sustain the potential and developments that we can currently see. So to activate this for the Belarusian society in the long run, because these structures are the prerequisite for an active civil society in your country, especially in countries where you don't have a long year tradition of democracy. It is very difficult to convince people to become active and to get committed because, of course, they always expose themselves to a certain risk. This is a big challenge that we still see and feel in Eastern Germany 30 years after the fall of the wall. I mean, our commitment in the former GDR is still less than the commitment in former Western Germany. And we have tried to activate people ever since to take care of their own home, their own workplace, to become a trade union member, to become politically active, because this is the foundation of a long-term active society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Gavitz. Now, I'm moving to the questions. I will only have one on my part, and then we will focus on the questions from our spectators and listeners. My question is primarily to the Belarusian participants. You interact a lot, your initiatives interact a lot with the local authorities. And I'm interested in how your nature of relations changed after the state has entered the repressive mode. But on the other hand, uh, uh, there are constant directives uh, from the highest level to have the dialects uh, at the local level and to um, initiate constitutional debate uh, with local communities. So even the centralized authorities try to interact with the regions. So how did you feel about the... Uh, how closed or open uh, the local authorities were and how liberal or retrograde were they? So, yeah, if you want to answer, you can just uh, show me that you want to. Okay, so, Tatiana, the floor is yours. So, thank you for the question. As I have already said, we do not see the wish on the part of the authorities to openly discuss with uh, all the stakeholders, especially the uh, non-governmental actors, uh, I mean, on the issue of uh, reforms. But what happened was that there was a quick transition to the local agenda, local change agenda, and it became much more politicized because uh, now the civil society has the unified set of requirements, but the authorities are not ready to comply. And we can see that in specific cases because our organization has uh, participated uh, in uh, revocation of uh, the the deputy mandate and uh, the request that the deputies uh, report and become more accountable and open to dialects. But now we only see the, um, the picture of that dialogue. But the authorities just keep discussing with themselves, in fact. So we have constant reports about the dialect platforms where nobody has ever been advised it. You know, they only invite uh, their own counterparts and they only communicate with traditional pro-governmental organizations like uh, Belarus, BRSM, uh, the Union of Women, the uh, state-owned trade union organization, even though there was an opportunity to involve uh, broader public 
And again, the local functioners, local officials, uh, they see that the people are active, and as they do, they probably maybe would like to have any discussions, but are not yet prepared to do so because there is that uh, administrative system and there is a ban to do that, in fact. So to change uh, uh, the Constitution, to collect the suggestions on constitutional reforms, um, like the discussions are basically clo open, uh, at least uh, they tell us they are, but they don't yield any tangible result. And uh, there are constitutional changes that are announced that are unacceptable and not interesting for the civil society. Does anybody else want to take the floor? Um, so, but please try to fit your comments within a minute. Yes, Olga, the floor is yours. Uh, was I given the floor? Yes, Olga, uh, right now we're just listening to somebody else here in your room. So from my own experience of communicating with the local authorities, uh, as, uh, that uh, in fact uh, the local authorities are pretty much paralyzed in Belarus. There is tough legal climate. So of course on the one hand people like go to work and so on, but in most cases they just have no idea what's happening. So. Um, of course, they are like uh, pro-presidential and uh, they uh, do all the ideological stuff, but they do understand that the situation is rapidly changing and they don't want to be subjected to popular hate, not in the local communities. In Minsk, the situation may be different, but uh, in small communities, it is really a pain to just walk around and see people looking at you like you're something evil. So uh, there are several dimensions to that, one of which is that uh, we found it actually easier to agree with the local authorities if we threaten them with uh, making some information public. Uh, once they uh, hear that uh, we're going to make some situation public, they become much more uh, willing to negotiate. Because, you know, there are some stories of success just that we don't tell about just because we don't want to scare off the local authorities that we came to an agreement with, which is rather interesting. And then there is also the point that um, for the officials right now, it is important not to get noticed, to be, stay in the shadow. And this is the situation that allows the local activists to um, achieve fast results in some cases. So basically, that's it. Thank you very much, Olga. Anybody else willing to take the floor? Shall we switch to chat questions? You can raise your hands if you want. Okay, no volunteers. So then let us switch to the questions. Many of them, and there are some specific questions directed at specific people. For example, there is a question to Alexander related to the trade unions. How much are the trade unions ready to the possible transformations? Uh, are they okay with the liberal agenda? This is something along the lines of what uh, Ms. Gavitz said. So, uh, yeah, that was the point where not all of the people were ready to all of the facets of uh, the reforms. To talk about the independent trade unions, over the last years we have been insisting in our training, and this is stipulated in our documents, that without economic reforms and economic transformations that also, of course, uh, imply a number of aspects, we have no future. And in fact, uh, trade unions are not a kind of organization that uh, advocate transformations that could feel as a shock and problems to their measures, to their members, but we are an exception to the general rule. Our situation is um, out of the box, let us say. And I really did hear on a number of occasions that I am a neoliberal, 
that I am an advocate of radical reforms and privatizations, but one has to understand that when people understand the system that Mr. Lukashenko has built, this is, you know, the extreme governmental capitalism, the extreme left approach. So, you know, the current labor code of Belarus is actually a dream document for any neoliberal. You can just take it as it is. And, you know, if we look at Russia, for example, the oligarchic Russia typically requires a long way to uh, uh, change the labor conditions. In our case, it may take just like 24 hours. So, actually, I uh, talked to the local strike committees and uh, um, I was told that it's a very sensitive issue. You know, I heard all those horror stories of privatization. And I brought the example of Ural Potash, Ural Kali. I know the situation there, more or less. You know that the owner of uh, Ural Kali is um, our compatriot. They are, the labor conditions are incomparable, even though the enterprise was uh, along the same, st developed along the same lines and started at the same point as Belarus Kali. But, you know, many people from Belarus Kali are really looking there, and they, many of them have moved to a different uh, working place, basically to Ural Kali. Because, you know, the state capitalist with the only cap oligarch on top is the system that cares the least about the well-being of the people who work at the public enterprises. We can... we only have one way out, the economic transformation. We have had enough. We're fed up with the inhumane governmental system. And an official who is not responsible for anything will never compare to an owner who bears the full responsibility for themselves and for their employees. Thank you, Thank you so much, Alexander. And the Russian ambassador, Dmitry Mezentsev, is now the owner of Ural Kali. This is Dmitry Mazepin, a different individual. This is our compatriot, actually. There is a question to Madame Gavitz. You have drawn a parallel to uh, Germany in 1989. So what is the role of Germany in potential settlement of the Belarusian crisis? Well, I think on the one hand, the European Union as a whole should take a very careful look at the situation in Belarus. It has to actively accompany the developments there. And in hindsight, we have to say that transformation processes always go hand in hand with economic difficulties, because no matter how bad an economy is, Normally, it is relatively stable. And what we have seen in the GDR is that many people or issues that were caused by the economic transformation caused to accusations of people. They said, or they blamed the democratic structures for the issues. And the same could also happen in your country, so that people say democracy and economic difficulties have to be equal. They are basically the same. And of course, we have to make sure that in a transformation process, which is always difficult, is economically designed and accompanied. It has to be accompanied in a way that people do not equal democracy and economic issues. And I think this is going to be a challenge and task also for Germany. We have to make sure that we foster a respective process. Belarus has a lot of potential that can be tapped, and I think that this can help a lot. In addition to acute economic pressure and political pressure, we need to say we need democracy, free elections, a supporting civil society. 
But we also need an economic perspective for a new economic model for Belarus, because the country that requires democracy also needs prospects for their population so that people understand how they can make ends meet. Thank you so much, Tatiana. There is a question addressed to you. Are NGOs ready for transformation of political into political parties in the context of the ongoing changes? It cannot speak for everyone, but uh, please share your example and your vision. Thank you so much for this question. I would like to say that those people who have expressed their participation and eagerness to engage in civic initiatives, some of them join the local initiatives with the potential of participation in local elections. Others, and there are some examples, organize themselves in public associations. Due to this, there is a strong demand for participation in the decision-making process. So there are some party initiatives, and Speak the Truth is one of them. Until 2012, uh, this question uh, was not discussed by us, but now we are developing it. And there are some other initiatives that are being discussed in the social media, including a women's party and some other initiatives, but I wouldn't like to name them. Anyway, there are some discussions in place. There is some strong demand for participation in the democratic decision-making process. And this is truly a positive development because the society is ready to stand up for their interests. Currently, there are no deputies in the parliament or in the local communities that are representing the interests of the population. And this has been realized by Belarusians. I would like to uh, raise this question one more time, Tatiana. Is the organization going to transform itself into a party? Yes, we're working on it. We have a committee which is dedicated to this transformation into a party. We have initiatives uh, in the local communities. So we are preparing for that. Thank you so much. There is a question that I will probably address to the participants that did not take the last two questions, Sergei and Olga in particular. So have these protests and ad hoc initiatives turned into a new challenge for the traditional civil society? Because as far as I know, this was discussed yesterday during the panel discussion. So. Do you feel that this is a new challenge that you are not ready to deal with? Sergei, Olga, Olga, please. Yes, indeed, this was a huge challenge for us. And our organization uh, was always focused on its infrastructure. And we hope that uh, would happen some miracle and we would receive some new stakeholders joining us and that's why we were developing our infrastructure uh, premised on this fact at the same time we had an explosive uptick in the civil engagement we had several thousand individuals joining us and many of our initiatives received a new life. August for us was associated with the challenges related to huge numbers of individuals that were writing to us that were suggesting to do something and they would actually take it as an insult if we did not respond to their suggestions. So the challenge was to adapt ourselves to this huge inflow of people and at the same time we had really great highly motivated individuals that had completely no experience in grassroots initiatives implementation. They had absolutely no understanding of what a public association can be. So we actually found ourselves experiencing a deficit for tools required to educate the population. 
we had some cases when a individual came to us and he wanted to do something but was not able to perform that function due to his or her capacities this was a huge challenge for us we actually managed to settle this but still the question remains open with regard to how this mobilization can be ensured rapidly in order not to lose people joining us and in order to direct them to the platforms where they could be most effective. And actually, we had a lot of people, we had huge crowds of people eager to help us, and we really wanted them to provide this assistance, but we could not actually somehow respond to all those suggestions. Well, I hope that will uh, keep happening in the next years. Certainly, but when people uh, are not accommodated, when they are not met halfway, they quickly become discouraged, and that is an issue. Sergey, what about you? What about your vision? We cannot hear you. Please try to adjust your settings like you did the previous time. Sergey, we still cannot hear you. Keep trying. Нет, 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 к сожалению, нет. Still nothing. You have some 10 seconds to adjust your settings. Otherwise, we shall move on. Still no good. <laughs> yes, we have to move on. I'm sorry for this technical issue. We have some time remaining to take one question and to address it to Alexander. This question is related to trade unions and strike committees. Is there any cooperation between these two movements? Is there any interaction between the ad hoc strike movements and the long-standing trade unions movement? Can members of strike committees that are not members of your trade union association be somehow integrated into your structure? And please switch on your microphone, Alexander. A lot has been said about this. And the unique feature of our revolution or uprising is in the fact that we had no national vertically organized headquarters and this helped us to actively develop horizontal linkages back in august it was possible to establish an all national strike committee later on it became completely obvious that this is impossible and in order to secure the people, we exerted every effort to minimize direct contacts. And you will not even believe it if I tell you that we had too much unnecessary attention. And I would like to tell you, actually, that we are absolutely not linked with the strike committees, although it is hard to believe in. But this is due to the environment in which we are currently operating. Be that as it may, there is some certain interaction, there is some engagement. We try to shape a common strategy and it does yield some results. Every day we have new people joining the all-national strike, and this is extremely important, not only in terms of some direct economic impact inflicted on the economy. This is purely political, and social influence, which we currently are exerting on the regime. And the members of the strike committees, 
that are not related to trade unions at all, including independent trade unions, should interact with us. But at the same time, we have never set the objective to join them. I believe we are moving in the right direction. And we aspire to build a new democratic country where joining some trade unions or establishing some trade unions is not mandatory at all. There are many forms of cooperation that are suitable for regular individuals that have the same goals, and that can ensure some positive synergy in this context. I'm sorry, Alexander, I am forced to stop our discussion. It can go on and on and on, but the time frame is really rigid, and we need to yield the floor to other panelists participating in another panel that is dedicated to the prospects of Belarus. Thank you very much for being so active. Thank you for raising the questions in the chat. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much and see you.